Paula. Take over, please. Thank you. The next topic <coughs> is on climate change and health implication after the Paris Agreement. Uh, about mitigation and adaptation actions, the scientific communities and the environmental uh, epidemiology ones uh, has to play now and will also play in the future a very important role to promote scientific research in this field. Adaptation will require efforts for the design, implementation, and transfer of technologies able to cut emissions, while raising the resilience of all countries, especially of the most vulnerable area to the impact of climate change. So with a great pleasure, I introduce the next speaker, Andy Hines, Professor of Public Health and Primary Care at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, he was director of the London School until the 2010. And uh, Andy Hines chaired the, the, an international task force on climate change mitigation, public health, which published a series of articles in the Lancet uh, in 2009. All of us know this publication. His current research includes the study of the health cost benefit and economic impact of low carbon policies in the transport, food, and agriculture and housing sector. So uh, the title of this presentation is Facing the Challenge of Climate Change, the prospect, Prospects for Health Following the Paris Agreement. So please, uh, uh, Andy. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to give you a kind of brief overview of the links between health and climate change. And I want to start out by acknowledging the tremendous legacy of Tony McMichael. I think many of us who worked with him over the years still miss him tremendously his very wise counsel, and also his very far-sighted uh, research vision. Uh, he was very early to pick up the health linkages to climate change, as early as the 1990s. And his seminal book, uh, Planetary Overload, was written more than 20 years ago, and I think it very, very clearly and accurately um, outlines some of the challenges that we face now. So we've been asked to declare interests, and it's particularly important in this area because, unfortunately, uh, things being what they are, climate change and climate change in health, has become quite a politicized uh, topic. So uh, th those are my um, current funding sources. So it's important to say that climate change, of course, is just one of a number of dramatic changes that's taking place in the global environment. And uh, these, uh, the sum of these changes has led an increasing number of scientists to state that we're now in the Anthropocene epoch, which is a entirely new geological epoch, very distinct from the Holocene epoch in which human societies developed, which is a relatively benign environmental epoch of 11,000 years or so. But since the middle of the last century, uh, we've seen dramatic changes in the global environment, and climate change is one of those. In our report of the Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, published in the Lancet last year, we outlined a whole range of these changes and the potential linkages between human health, but also the potential solutions that could both safeguard health and promote sustainability. Some of the trends are, are summarized on this slide. Dramatic loss of tropical forests, biodiversity loss probably a hundredfold greater than pre-human era, Increasing water shortages caused by the exploitation of finite aquifers that cannot be replenished on human life scales that mean that the world population of perhaps 3 billion people um, is experiencing some degree of water shortage. And of course, that will have big implications for irrigation, agriculture, industry in the future. And our oceans are acidifying as CO2 dissolves in the oceans and that's going to change the marine um, environment very dramatically. But of course, we're here today talking about climate change. We've already seen about one degree uh, warming since pre-industrial uh, times. And um, that warming is, is continuing to go ahead. This slide just shows you the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, which have more than doubled since 1970. So you can see on the slide before 1970, about 900 gigatons of CO2 after 1970, uh, about 1,100 gigatons of CO2. So the pace, at least until very recently, has been uh, speeding up. And what you can see from this slide, which is the green area, is that the increasing contribution 
is from the Asian, the emerging Asian economies, particularly India, of course, and China. So historically, it's been the um, OECD countries, the so-called developed countries, but now increasingly other players are coming uh, and increasing their emissions dramatically. And this, of course, is posing a tremendous challenge to uh, constrain uh, climate change in the future. CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, it's the most important one. It's responsible for about 70% of, of global warming, uh, depending on what time scale you take. But CO2 is important because it's very long-lived. So about 20, 25% of CO2 that we put up in the atmosphere today will still be there in, in a thousand years' time. So we are making policies that will affect the health and well-being of many, many uh, future uh, generations. So uh, as I've said, CO2 is not the only um, climate change pollutant, um, and there are a whole range of short-lived pollutants that are summarized on this slide. So there's black carbon, which is produced by the incomplete combustion of solid fuels, could be biomass, uh, coal, other sources, poorly uh, maintained diesel engines, and so on. And these have, this has very, very brief uh, atmospheric lifetime, but it does contribute very significantly to warming. It's often co-emitted with cooling aerosols, so the net effect is sometimes unclear, and it depends very much uh, on the source. Methane, we've heard about from the previous presentation, uh, natural gas leaks and so on, rice paddies, uh, ruminants, tropospheric ozone, of course, which is formed from uh, precursors um, in, in the uh, atmosphere, methane, of course, being, being one of them, and hydrofluorocarbons, which are a class of chemicals that are increasingly used um, in re as refrigerants, but also other industrial sectors, which at the moment don't contribute very much, but if they were unrestrained, unrestricted, then they could be very serious contributors in the, in the future. Black carbon is also important because it's when it's deposited on snow and ice, it accelerates the melting, so it has other effects and also has important um, implications for health, as I'll mention uh, in a moment. So uh, where are we going in the future? Well, this slide taken from IPCC um, compares really two different scenarios for the future. One of them is the so-called RCP 2.6, the 2.6 um, refers to the number of watts per meter squared, the radiative forcing, representative concentration pathway. And that really presumes that we take really quite uh, drastic action to reduce greenhouse gas and, and short-lived uh, climate pollutant emissions in the very near future and keep temperature below two degrees, which is the target that the nations in Paris agreed that we need to try and keep uh, below. That's not a precise target, of course, but many climatologists believe that above that level, there's a greater probability of catastrophic, very severe climate-related events, which will have a long-term impact on human well-being. The other contrasting scenario is a RCP 8.5, which is essentially um, unrestricted, uh, relatively unrestrained um, CO2 and other GHG emissions. And that was a pathway which, on, until recently, it looked like we might be on. But more recently, it looks like there has been a flattening off of emissions in the last couple of years. So that would take us up to four degrees or maybe even more by the end of the century. RCP 2.6 hopefully keep us below two degrees. So there's a big difference between them. And the Paris Agreement leaves us somewhere between the two, probably around 2.7, three degrees or so. But I'll come back to that um, towards the end of my talk. But of course, it's not just temperature which changes, it's also precipitation and soil moisture. And this slide shows you um, the comparison between recent past and the end of this century for soil moisture change. And it's taken as an average of over 30 climate models because there is quite a lot of uncertainty about soil moisture projections. And what you can see is a fairly consistent message from a range of models that there'll be increased drying around the Mediterranean, southern Africa, southern parts of the US, Central America, and north parts of Latin America, as well as parts of Australia. So this seems to be a fairly um, consistent signal that's coming out of these climate models. But other parts of the world, of course, have increased precipitation events. So there's the possibility of both increased uh, droughts, but also increased uh, flooding events due to increased intense precipitation, which themselves, of course, have import <coughs> excuse me, important um, climate impacts, uh, health impacts. 
if I could get back, yes, that's it. So this slide really just tries to summarize a lot of the complex relationships, which I don't really have time to go into. So I'm going to really pick out a few key issues from this complex uh, nexus of links between human health and climate change. You can see that climate change can affect human health through a whole range of pathways. Very direct, increasing thermal stress, for example, increasing sea level rise, extreme weather events, also by affecting air pollution, um, and of course it can affect a whole range of communicable diseases, um, as well as having long-term effects on mental health through extreme events. Um, algal blooms, for example, may also be a problem, and they can affect, it can affect nutrition through effects on crop yields. So as you can see, there's a real prospect there of, because of the complexity, perhaps of risk underestimates, which is a, a prospect which the Lancet Climate Change Commission pointed to in its uh, recent report uh, last year. And of course, we're not estimating effects against a completely neutral background. Our climate had already started to change, say by the mid-1950s, things were already changing. So that our historical uh, records also include uh, probably a climate change signal. Uh, and of course, we've seen dramatic improvements in health in recent decades, over a 20-year increase in life expectancy, but many of us fear that climate change and these other environmental changes have the potential to uh, halt and perhaps even reverse that improvement in health. So this is just one example. This is a recent, uh, as yet unpublished piece of work being led by Tord Kjellstrom with a number of us, <coughs> looking at exposure to extremes of thermal stress. And this slide uses the wet bulb globe temperature, which is a widely used measure of exposure to thermal extremes. And it shows you the monthly mean wet bulb globe temperature for the hottest month for towards the end of this century for an emissions pathway which is roughly consistent with uh, some of the Paris Agreement. So it's perhaps around three degrees centigrade warming uh, by the end of the century. And what you can see is that by the end of the century, quite large proportions of the tropics, in some cases the subtropics, will be experiencing wet bulb globe temperatures of over 30 degrees. At the moment, very few people in the world live um, in these kind of areas which experience these WBGT levels of over 30 degrees, and really no one lives at 31 degrees. Um, so this is a kind of new experience for humanity, and it raises all sorts of challenges to health. One of them, of course, is labor productivity, which is already probably being affected by climate change, so it's becoming progressively more difficult to engage in uh, labor in tropical and subtropical regions. And as we've heard, that could have important gender implications, not just for women who work in sweatshops, but also because many subsistence farmers are also uh, women subsistence farmers, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. O also, <coughs> um, clearly one could adapt to this if one had universal access to air conditioning, perhaps uh, that may be, even by the end of the century, difficult to sustain across um, th these whole world regions. So this does um, pose major threats uh, to habitability, and this is a very um, active area for research and one that we are continuing to work on um, uh, as we speak, so to speak. So another uh, issue which is um, uh, going to be really important for human health, of course, is the effects of climate change on crop yield and on uh, nutrition. And this slide just summarizes, again, the average from a whole range of different climate models looking at um, cereal grain yields. And it reinforces the point uh, about the fact that many of the populations most vulnerable to climate change will be those who have contributed least. So it's the poor populations in tropical and subtropical regions that will be particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, in this case on cereal grain yields. Most of the work's been done on cereals. We don't know so much about fruit and vegetables, but they're very important also, of course, for human health. Recent paper in The Lancet suggests that perhaps an increase in half a million deaths per annum around mid-century um, as a result of the reductions in crop yields, partly as a result um, of uh, uh, reduced um, crop yields le leading to increased ch child deaths uh, due to undernutrition, uh, but also uh, reductions in fruit and vegetable uh, consumption, which is an important driver uh, of NCD risk, of course. Some of that may be partly offset by reductions in, in obesity, 
but there doesn't seem any doubt that on a net basis, <coughs> there'll be substantial increases in the number of deaths due to uh, nutritional causes as a consequence of climate change by the middle of the century. Of course, later on, we may see also adverse effects in temperate regions where for the next few decades, agricultural yields may, may increase, but that's not so clear towards the end of the century. So very, very major challenges indeed, which will have big effects, for example, on stunting in, in young children in Africa and Asia. And my colleagues, Shari Kovats and others, have shown a risk in, uh, of in extreme uh, severe stunting um, towards the middle of the century. But climate change, of course, is not the only factor affecting the agricultural system. And this slide, taken from a paper by Sam Myers and colleagues uh, last year in The Lancet, which looks at the impacts of loss of pollinators. Now, pollinators are declining for a range of reasons, changes in land use, uh, pesticide use, and other factors as well. Maybe climate change is playing some role. But it just emphasizes the fact that we shouldn't consider climate change alone. We need to consider the multiplicity uh, of uh, environmental factors affecting our food system. And this shows you on the top part of the slide the increased numbers of deaths from NCDs, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. And on the bottom part, malnutrition and communicable diseases, particularly, of course, um, in children, particularly in tropical and subtropical regions. So very substantial increase in, in deaths if we were to lose all of our pollinators, perhaps 1.4 uh, million, something of that order. Sea level <coughs> rise is another important uh, threat to human health. This slide just summarizes uh, where many millions more people are projected to be flooded every year due to sea level rise by the latter part of the century. This may be conservative because it doesn't take into account some of the more recent work about the Antarctic ice sheet, for example, the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, which would lead to <coughs> much higher levels of um, sea level rise, perhaps ultimately up to seven meters or so. But it does show you that in parts of the world, very large cities, over a million people, in, in the deltas of the Nile, the Mississippi, the Mekong, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, would face uh, serious challenges towards the end of the century. Some work that we're doing, uh, Pauline Shielbeck, uh, who's here, um, been presenting some, some work, some other work, but she's been doing some work in coastal Bangladesh with uh, Bangladeshi colleagues, um, with Paolo Vinesis Group and Imperial College, looking at the health effects of salination of um, uh, drinking water in coastal Bangladesh. And the top map shows you where there are many low-lying uh, coastal areas that are vulnerable to saltwater intrusion. And um, uh, you can see that many coastal populations rely on surface and shallow water ground sources for their drinking water. There's an unusually high incidence of preeclampsia in pregnant women in coastal Bangladesh. And research has shown that there's a significant association with drinking water sodium intake. And furthermore, in non-pregnant adults, as you get uh, changes in uh, the source of drinking water, you move to low saline, rainwater-based alternatives, you can reduce blood pressure. And the odds of hypertension, given in this slide, reduces very substantially. So this shows you how environmental change, not just climate change, but also interacting with other local environmental changes can have effects on uh, NCD risks and on pregnancy risks. The area of extreme events, of course, has been one in which there's a burgeoning amount of research, and there's been um, quite a lot of developments in the attribution of events to climate change itself. A recent paper in PNAS, for example, by Kelly and colleagues, suggested that the record drought in Syria, which many people think precipitated or at least was involved in the kind of complex nexus of events which led to the current Syrian tragedy, um, was partly related to climate change. At least the risk was more than doubled by climate change. And this slide just shows you the time course for the drought in Syria between 2005-10, the way in which people moved into the cities, um, the wheat and food prices doubled, and this was culminated in an uprising in uh, March 2011, which of course has led to this prolonged um, internal conflict, which is still not settled. So um, this is... Uh, a very interesting area of work, quite methodologically difficult, but I think um, does give us um, a, a closer understanding, really, of how climate change can trigger these complex events. Another example would be the country of Pakistan. Pakistan faces a number of challenges. It's got the highest population growth outside sub-Saharan Africa. 
It's faced very major um, events in recent years, major floods and droughts, which have affected more than 10 million people. And last year, there was a major, major heat wave, which was illustrated on this slide, which uh, resulted in temperatures of um, over 42 degrees in the southern part of Pakistan. So this combination of events changes, for example, in the mass balance of glaciers in the Himalayas, the headwaters of the Indus River, effects on irrigation, um, and so on, really poses quite a challenge to a country like Pakistan. And there's already some evidence from a paper published in 2010 that rural laborers in Pakistan are beginning to migrate from rural areas to urban areas in relation to these very high levels of thermal stress that are being experienced. So, of course, <coughs> humanity can adapt to some degree to climate change, but there will be physical, behavioral, and technological limits on how much we can adapt. And, of course, who would pay for that adaptation? There will be adaptation funds as a result of the climate change agreement, but will these be sufficient to pay for some of the adaptation to some of the uh, factors or some of the changes that I've outlined earlier? There are physical limits, such as small, low-lying islands. There are behavioral limits. Many people are attached to, li to living in areas which are vulnerable to extreme events. And there are technological limits to uh, flood defenses that can be constructed. So we don't yet know where all of those limits exist, and they will differ from different societies. But again, undoubtedly, um, because the adaptation costs will fall particularly on those populations that have not been largely responsible for climate change, at least in the near term, then that will need to be addressed in the climate change um, settlement. So in the concluding part of my talk, I want to just uh, wrap up by talking about the benefits of action, not just the benefits of less adaptation, but also the benefits of a cleaner economy. And very, very briefly, much of the work's been done in these four sectors, including our Lancet series of 2009. There are other sectors too, um, uh, occupational sectors, as we heard yesterday in one of, one of the sessions. And by the way, there have been a lot of good presentations um, in this conference on healthcare benefits. So let me just touch on one or two key messages. Um, one in recent, very important publication is from the International Energy Agency, Energy and Air Pollution, which came out just a few weeks ago, their special report. And in that, they proposed that a 7% increase in investment could save over 3 million lives in, in 2040, whilst providing energy access for all lower energy import bills and leading to a peak CO2 by 2020. So they mapped a pathway by which we could reach a low carbon, a much healthier future, but with very uh, comparatively little added investment. When you consider that we need to invest more than $70 trillion anyway, the additional uh, small percentage increase for cleaner energy really makes an enormous amount of um, financial and social sense. We've also, um, until recently, haven't taken into account the health economic benefits of reducing air pollution through low carbon policies. A range of studies have shown marginal benefits. This one from Nature Climate Change suggests marginal benefits of 50 to $380 a ton, uh, which um, exceed the abatement costs in many cases. And the other striking feature is that we have massive subsidies in the system. The IMF report uh, last year suggested there are $5.3 trillion annual subsidies to fossil fuels, and much of that is because we don't pay the full economic cost of the fossil fuels that we do burn. We don't pay the full economic cost of the air pollution, nor do we pay the cost of climate change to our generation and future generation. And as we've already heard um, elsewhere in this conference, addressing coal combustion is a pressing uh, priority, although not the only one. But I also wanted to emphasize that the short-lived pollutants themselves can give very useful co-benefits, and this is taken from the UNEP report of 2011, uh, where, um, and it's being very much promoted by the Climate and uh, Clean Air Coalition, of which I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Panel, um, and they showed that reducing black carbon emissions could prevent uh, perhaps uh, over two million deaths with substantial um, uncertainty, particularly premature deaths um, in Asia, but also other parts of the world. And some of the mechanisms by which that could happen are illustrated on this slide, most particularly, of course, clean household energy through improved stoves, clean fuel, um, affordable electrification, and so on. And that has the potential to tackle the burden of indoor air pollution, household air pollution, which kills, of course, about 
uh, million people every year, um, including many uh, women and children, of course. So a lot of potential there for public health benefits. And combining CO2 and the short-lived pollutants, black carbon, methane, ozone, as mentioned earlier, could really help us to keep below the two degree targets as illustrated in this slide. What it shows you is that with CO2 alone or short-lived climate pollutants alone, we will um, struggle and we'll probably miss that two degree target. But if we could implement mitigation strategies that address both of these, and they're both important, um, then we could have a very good chance of keeping below the two degree target. But that requires really um, active implementation of mitigation strategies in the very near future. The future of our climate will obviously depend on cities. They are the engines of economic and so growth and social change, and they produce many of our global energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. The slide shows you a comparison of Atlanta and Barcelona, their land area, which is about 20-fold um, uh, greater in the case of Atlanta, their population, which is about the same, and their transport carbon emissions, which are 10-fold greater in Atlanta than Barcelona. So what this shows us is that the urban planning, particularly those cities that have yet to be built or are emerging and expanding very rapidly in Africa in particular, provide a tremendous opportunity to develop much uh, cleaner cities, much lower carbon footprint than our cities uh, today. We and others have done a lot of work on low carbon transport and active travel and shown that the health co-benefits of these in many um, situations uh, dramatically exceed any increase in risks, for example, due to road traffic injury. And this slide at the, at the bottom just shows you the potential costs averted to the UK National Health Service by uh, a low carbon and active travel policies. Um, and uh, the balance of these benefits, whether it's air pollution or physical activity, it obviously depends on the background level of air pollution. Um, certainly in a highly polluted city, both would be very important in a city like London, then physical activity um, predominates. So there's a lot that cities can do to mitigate and adapt to climate change through transport and active travel, green spaces and ecosystem strategies for resilience, housing improvements, water and sanitation, and a universal access to clean energy. I come to the end and I don't really have much time to say much about food and agriculture except to say that it's often a neglected sector. It does contribute perhaps 20% to greenhouse gas emissions and there are a number of strategies outlined in this slide which can help us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through reduction of food waste but also um, promoting particularly plant-based diets, lower emission diets as illustrated um, on this slide. And some work that we've been doing has shown that in the UK, for example, just by getting the population to eat a diet that conforms to WHO guidelines, that would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and food by about 17%. And you can get to about a 40% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions through dietary change, which doesn't involve movement to a completely vegetarian diet, but rather a reduction in animal products. So, um, to conclude, um, where are we after Paris? Well, this slide just summarizes the state of affairs. The top of the slide shows you um, the kind of emissions gap. It shows you where we need to be, and you can see that the bottom blue line shows you that we need to decarbonize the world economy during this uh, century. And the top gray line shows you the kind of trajectory of fairly unmitigated um, emissions. The bottom part of the slide shows us the current policy trajectory, and below that you can see the commitments that countries made in, in Paris. But of course these essentially are voluntary commitments, it's going to be difficult to hold countries to them. Some of them are conditional on other actions and some of them are unconditional. If we take into account the conditional, um, the deter nationally determined uh, contributions of greenhouse gas reductions as agreed in Paris, we still have a gap of around 12 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So there's still a very big gap between what was agreed in Paris and the two degree temperature, uh, centigrade temperature range that many policymakers and climatologists feel is desirable. So what this means in a nutshell is that we still have a lot of work to do. Paris was a very important milestone politically, 
it cr really created a new kind of social consensus that something needed to be done, but it still leaves an enormous amount of work to be done to get down to two degrees, to adapt to the kind of climate change that's already in the pipeline that we can't do anything to prevent. And this, I think, means that we um, in the public health community have to redouble our voice and ensure that public health becomes center stage um, in climate change negotiations. And it's very gratifying to see that climate change now has become such a key topic in the ISEE conference. Uh, and as Tony McMichael pointed out many years ago, there are some key research challenges which we're still grappling with to better quantify the health care benefits of the low carbon economy, to evaluate adaptation strategies, to understand vulnerable populations, um, and the broad range of impacts of climate change on health. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We have time only for one question. If there is one important, very important question, because we, we are late. No? So please, please don't go to the Hello? coffee break. Hello? Wait one moment. Just one question. Over the back. Oh, Hi, Andy. Uh, Wyla Delemi from University of California, San Diego. So, given all the what you've shown, why isn't there serious funding to support this, similar to what happened to the HIV, for example, especially like NIH? Is, you would be hard pressed to find any finding, uh, funding. Is it better in Europe or in the UK? Thank you very much. Very important question. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that many of the strategies um, and policies that need to be implemented and evaluated are not necessarily in the health sector. So they're intersectoral across a whole range of sectors, uh, as I've explained. And so they don't fall very neatly into the funding um, portfolio of many of the biomedical funders. They are actually, um, in the UK, that they need to be taken up across our national research councils. And Certainly in the UK and I think in the, in the US as well, we're not very good about tackling some of these big cross-cutting issues. There are, however, some early signs of change. We've got the Wellcome Trust, for example, which has agreed to put um, 75 million pounds, that's about a, over 100 million dollars, into research in this broad area of our planet, our health, over the next five years. The Rockefeller Foundation is putting up some money in. And there, are, there is beginning to be some changes in funding, but it's really too little and it's awfully late. So we do need to keep the pressure up to try to ensure uh, that more funding does come into this area. Thank you.